Now we're going to look at a big impressive result and it's even got a big impressive proof and in fact it's even got two big impressive proofs and we're going to go through both of them because they're both kind of neat. Axler talks about this and he's right. You see some different insights from the two different proofs. They both more or less work on the same idea or mechanism and that is you can do a proof by induction in which you peel off the span of an eigenvector as a, a one-dimensional invariant subspace and and break down your vector space accordingly um, and that allows you to reduce it to looking at some lower dimensional thing to which your inductive hypothesis applies all right so with that in mind here's the theorem if v is a finite dimensional complex vector space and you've got a operator on it then v has a basis for which that operator has an upper triangular matrix. Okay, so proof number one. So, and, and like I said, we're gonna do this by induction on the dimension of, of V. And so this result is a uh, obvious if uh, we're in dimension one because uh, then we've got a one by one matrix aka a number and it's trivially going to be uh, upper triangular no matter what um, <clears throat> so let's assume our inductive hypothesis which is that the result um, holds for any vector space of lesser dimension. All right. Okay, and so then um, let's let lambda be an eigenvalue. Uh, whoa, whoa, eigen and value of t and uh, we showed that this is okay we proved that they exist back in 521 and we're going to define uh, and the invariant subspace u which is the range of t minus lambda i okay so then we have the following claim u is um, an invariant subspace of t and like we know from what we've seen before that the um, it would be an invariant subspace of t minus lambda i but it's actually an invariant subspace of t as well um, and also that we have the uh, that the dimension of this guy is strictly less than the dimension of v, and so this the the upshot of this uh, claim is that then the inductive hypothesis applies to t restricted to u acting as an operator on u. All right, so let's see. So to prove this claim, let's see, for the invariance part, um, observe that um, you can always write, uh, so if I have tu minus lambda u, and then I subtract the lambda u to the other side, or sorry, add it over to the other side. So this is true for, for any u whatsoever, right? I've just, I've written the same thing on each side of the equal signs and then like pulled one term over to the right. And so in particular, if uh, we do this for uh, an element of, of our, our space u here, then, <coughs> um, 
you notice that uh, this is in the range of t minus lambda i. So this one is in u. And then this is a scalar multiple of something in u. So this one is in u. And then u is um, a subspace. We proved that the range of anything is always a subspace. So that tells you then by closure that the guy on the left has to also be in u. So, um, <clears throat> So the right hand side, I don't know if I've used this before, right hand side RHS is in U, which implies that the left hand side is in U. Okay, so that gets us invariance. And then um, since uh, t minus lambda i is not injective uh, because we took lambda to be an eigenvalue. Then it is also not surjective because we're dealing with operators. And we know that for operators, you're injective if and only if you're surjective, if and only if you're invertible. And that was the content of uh, 369. So since we're not surjective, the dimension of the range has to be strictly less than the dimension of the whole space. Okay, that gives us our claim. So then we can apply the inductive hy hypothesis. So by the inductive hypothesis, um, we know that u has a basis, we'll call it u1 up through um. For which the matrix of t restricted to u is upper triangular. OK. Um, so then we can extend this to a basis of V all right okay and then so then we have a new claim claim number two um, if we apply t to uj, so this is uh, t restricted to u applied to uj, if you want to think about it that way, which is, then this is uh, in the span of v1 up through vj. That one kind of got messed up there. v1 through vj. Um, And um, if I apply t to the other basis element, tvk, then these are in the span of, and then we've got u1 up through um, and then v1 up through vk. OK. <clears throat> so, OK. This uh, first part with, with the UJs is immediate from uh, 526 that we proved before. So that was the invariance of the triangular basis. Um, <clears throat> so that one comes because we know that uh, M of the matrix of T restricted to U is upper triangular. Okay, so what about the V case? Well, so 
So for the VKs, if we look at uh, TVK, this is, um, again, we use the same sort of trick where we break this down as T minus lambda I VK plus lambda VK. Um, <clears throat> and then you can see that this is an element of, well, first off, uh, this thing here is by definition in the range of T minus lambda I, so that means that it's in U. And then we know that uh, the other part is uh, in the span of VK. Right, so, <clears throat> Um, and so for this this latter part uh, uh, here, we actually uh, for a given VK, we don't need the V1 up through that that precedes that given VK, as you can see from from this proof right here. But it doesn't hurt for me to uh, throw it in there. And then when we do, then uh, this condition given by the claim is exactly what we need to use theorem 526 again now on the entire extended basis. So um, conclusion by 526 again And we are done.